the CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall, bringing you, hopefully, an enjoyable shudder. Certainly, fans of the occult like the dark and dangerous tales we spin because of the vicarious enjoyment that comes from the delicious shivers of the supernatural. But let me issue a warning to all you ghost lovers. Do not, I repeat, do not ever make the mistake of thinking that ghosts are fun. Mrs. Mary Boyne and her husband did, and this tale tells what happened to them. Our mystery drama, Afterward, was adapted from the Edith Wharton classic, especially for the Mystery Theater, by Murray Burnett, and stars Celeste Holm. the phrase, Kilroy was here, so popular back in the days of World War II? I feel certain most of you remember, but if we go back a few years farther, how many of you recall the phrase, the little man who wasn't there? What do all these phrases have to do with our tale? Well, stretching a point, we might say that our story concerns the ghost that wasn't there, or at least not when you expected him. If this sounds confusing, let's listen to the lady whose story it is. My name is Mary Boyne. My address is Suite 357 in a wood, Dorsetshire, England. Of course, I'm American and alone and sane. The reason I mention sanity is because they call this place a rest home, but actually it's a place for people who have money and who are supposed to be not quite right in the head. I told you I'm sane, but I must confess it's difficult to understand how I managed to retain my sanity after what happened. But you be the judge and jury. I'll start at the beginning, back in America, in a little town of Waukesha, and the little house where I lived happily with Ned. Ned! You're home early! You bet. I'm not only home early, darling, but I'm home for good. I've sold the Blue Star Mine for five million dollars. Oh! Mary, Mary, oh. my love, are you all right? Oh, yes, you're fine, <laughs> darling, but... but I, you're joking! Never, never more serious. We're finished with drudgery, darling. Finished living in this house, in this town. And don't even bother to pack. Let's oh. just make our dream come true today. Oh. I know that Americans are often impulsive, generous, and even, forgive me, sometimes a trifle foolish. But I must. Say, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Boyne, you are something new in my experience as a realtor. Well, is that a nice English way of saying you don't have a suitable house for us? Not at all, Mr. Boyne. Oh, please forgive my husband, Mrs. Stair, but our search for a house in England is the answer to what both he and I have always considered an impossible dream. You see, I was born in England, and I went to America as a child, and... I've always wanted to return, and now we can. Uh, is it so strange that we want a house we ourselves can remodel and modernize? No, that's understandable. But to be so far from any means of transportation. Perhaps I should say that Ned and I are really looking for two things. To get away from our old lifestyle in America and to find our roots. Uh, yes, I have a house that seems to be made to order for your specifications. It's been on the market for years because it needs so much remodeling, and it's 14 miles from the nearest rail station. Great, great. Let me finish. It was built in the time of the Tudors. Oh. Needs a tremendous amount of modernization, particularly in the matter of heating and hot water. Sounds super to me. 
But how about a ghost, Mrs. Stair? Oh, Dorset chairs full of ghosts. That's nice. But I did so want one of my own, you know, right on the premises. Uh, Mrs. Boyden, you shouldn't ask for anything like that. There is a traditional ghost that goes along with the house. A particularly nasty ghost. Ghosts are a rather strange one. Strange? How so? Because the history of the ghost of your house at Ling is that no one knows that they've seen the ghost until long afterward. Well, that's crazy. What in the world makes a ghost a ghost? Except for the fact that you know when you see it. It either moans or wears white shrouds or touches you with icy fingers. Well, the only thing I can tell you is that there are stories about the ghost of Ling, and every single one of them is identical. The person who sees the ghost doesn't know it's a ghost until afterward. Oh, forget it, Mary. No, no, life is too short to enjoy a ghost. You've got to wait to find out if it's a real <laughs> ghost or not. No, but, th but this house at Ling seems to have so much else going for it. Darling, I think we really should take a look at it. We went, we looked, and we were conquered. Both Ned and I fell instantly in love with Ling. It was a lovely old Tudor house, just as the agent had described it. Exactly what we'd both dreamed of, and it was definitely secluded. We bought it and moved in. But although I was in seventh heaven and up to my ears in planning for remodeling the old house... There was something definitely wrong with Ned. Oh, these powders don't do a thing for my headaches. Well, the doctor said... I know what the doctor said, darling, and I followed his prescription, but I still have the headaches. Darling, mm -hmm. do you think perhaps we've made a mistake about this house? No, no, Ling is perfect. Perfect. We both knew it the moment we saw it. The gardens are a delight, and under your tender, loving care, grow more beautiful every day. Oh, with Hilton's great help. Nonsense. Oh, Hilton is a good gardener, darling, but he hasn't your green thumb. <laughs> no, no, my love. The house is perfect and there's absolutely nothing wrong. These headaches will go away in time. So you're not going to tell me? Dear heart, there is nothing to tell. But I knew better. Something was very wrong and I intended to find out what it was. Lydia Westlake was the village librarian and had been ever since the oldest inhabitant could remember. Well, hey, Mrs. Boyne, what a pleasure. Is there anything I can do for you? Miss Westlake, I really must apologize for not coming to see you and this lovely old library before. Oh, my dear, no apologies necessary. Everyone in town knows how busy you've been patching up, Ling. Well, that's one reason I'm here. To ask if you have any... Any books about the history of Ling? Ah, you mean about the architecture? Mm, not exactly. The whole... Well, everything. Maybe even something about the ghost. Well, I really shouldn't say this, but it's best for everyone to try to forget about the Ling ghost. Oh, believe me. Oh, I believe you, Miss Westlake, but I'm, I'm still interested in everything about Ling. Well, very well. You'll find some books on the history of Ling under G226. There were three books. I took them all and went back to Ling and started to read. Two incidents mentioned the Ling ghost, and they were absolutely horrifying. What I hadn't told the librarian was that I wanted to find out more about the ghost because of the way Ned was acting. Who the devil is it? Well, it's me, darling. I'm sorry, Mary. It's, it's just that I'm, uh... Well, I'm sorry. Have the servants been interrupting you? No, 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 no. Uh, oh, gosh, we've never kept secrets from each other. It's my consultation work with the Blue Star Mine back in the States. But why in the world should that be so disturbing? Well, there were, there were some, uh, problems I, I hadn't, uh, hadn't expected. But I've never seen you like this. Is there any chance we'll have to go back to America? No, 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 no. It's nothing like that. It's just that there's a... Well, there's a troublemaker who's after me. Uh, darling, tell me how you're coming with the house and your research on the ghost. I don't want to hear anything more about that ghost. Well, why this sudden about face? I just don't, that's all. Let's make a pact. You stop worrying, and I'll stop talking about the ghost. The pack didn't work. Oh, how I wish it had. Perhaps things would not have turned out the way they did. If we had left Ling, 
and I had listened to my presentiment about the Ling ghost. Ned grew more irritable, and I ever more frightened. What's the matter with those fools back in Waukesha? They can't handle the simplest matters without asking me a million questions. Ned, why don't you give up the consulting job? Oh. We don't really need it. I mean, do we? No, no, not the money, but in a way... Well, in a way, we do need it. I don't understand. Well, it's a complicated business, Mary, involving lawyers and a lot of legal matters that would only bore you. Bore me? I'd rather be bored or, or sad or anything. If only I could see you more relaxed. Well, you will. You will, darling. It, it'll just uh, take a little time. Time for what? Well, I, uh, I have problems with the Blue Star. So, uh, look, why, why don't you bring me up to date on your ghost, huh? Oh, Ned, because I'm frightened. I read a story in one of those books I took from the library about the young wife of the son of the man who built Ling. Oh, uh -huh. and what about it? Well, it seems she had fallen madly in love with one of the men here before she met the Ling's son. And, oh, Ned, must I? Well, please, darling, it can't be all that shocking now in this day and age. Well, she... she disposed of an unwanted child and kept it a secret. Oh, some years later, after she was happily married and had a little girl of her own, she was out strolling through these gardens one day when she met an absolutely enchanting young girl, mm -hmm. just about her daughter's age. They all hit it off very well, and, and soon the three became friends. The only thing was that they couldn't ever figure out where this enchanting child lived or who were her parents. And this began to worry the young mistress of Ling, until one day, her daughter disappeared and was never found or seen again. Well, I, uh, I don't understand. Don't you? The mother did. She had seen the ghost of Ling, her daughter's little friend. The ghost was the illegitimate child she'd killed. Only she didn't know till afterward. I'm sorry, Mary, for making you tell me that story. It's all right. There's more in those old books. There's something about a secret staircase. Oh? I should be able to locate it. You get a marvelous bird's eye view of the entire country. Well, that sounds like fun. Why don't you help me search for it? Ah, uh -uh, can't. Uh, I have to work on my correspondence, but if and when you find it, uh, give me a shot. I'll be in the library. I set off on another exploration of Ling, but this time with a purpose. And finally... Just like a heroine in some gothic novel, I pressed a panel of the old wainscoting in one of the rooms, and it slid back, revealing a small circular flight of stairs leading up. I climbed the tiny corkscrew staircase to the roof of Ling. Oh, the book hadn't exaggerated the beauty of the view. I called excitedly down the stairs, Ned, Ned, I found it, and it's beautiful. Come up here and see. Wow. Oh, darling, this is really something. <laughs> Why, you can see for miles. How did you find it? Just followed the directions in the book. Went around pressing the paneling, and suddenly there it was. The staircase. <laughs> My... Just look. Of course, I know you can see farther than I can. Oh, but darling, your eyes are more beautiful. <laughs> well, hello. Oh, who's that? Who? Where? Well, can't you see that man coming towards the house? I I've got to go down and see who it is. Ned! Ned! Wait for me! <laughs> There you are, darling. I've been looking all over for you. Oh, I've been uh, right here in the library. Oh, you dashed off that roof and went running out the front door. Who was it? Uh, who was what? The man you saw coming toward you in the garden. Oh, that man. Well, I, uh... You see, dear, I thought I saw the gardener and I ran after him to tell him about some of the drains which need tending. But, uh, you see, he'd disappeared before I reached him. Disappeared? Mm-hmm. But he seemed to be walking so slowly and toward the house, not away from it. Well, that, that's the way it seemed to me, too. But uh, I guess uh, we must have been wrong. Unless, uh, unless it could have been uh, the ghost. we all know there are no such things as ghosts, or at least some of us know. But one thing we would all agree upon is that 
If there really are ghosts, they won't go away even if you don't mention them. Institutions for the mentally ill have come a long way. They are quite beautiful and often look like an ideal retirement home. Even on the inside, where everyone wears a smile, it takes an expert to be able to see some of the anguish that lies behind the smile, like the pain that continually racks Mary Boyne. None of the staff nor the guests at Innerwood Rest Home can understand why I hate to hear the sound of the postman's whistle when he comes with the mail. They think it's because I have no one who cares enough to write to me. Well, it's true that I have no one, but the reason I dread the postman's whistle is because if it weren't for the postman and the mail and... There I am, confusing you again. But it all relates to one arrival of the mail at Lane. Oh, this is, uh... From old Joe Sitwell asking how we are, and uh, uh, this one's for you. I'm so glad there are no letters to disturb you. What's this? Hmm? Let me see. It's a newspaper clipping. Front page article from the Waukesha Sentinel. Oh. It says that a man named Elwell has brought a lawsuit against you. That there was something wrong about the Blue Star Mine. I haven't read it all, uh, but... Darling, uh, you wouldn't understand more than half of it, even if you finished. Well, maybe not. But now I understand what it is that's been bothering no, you. No, it, it's really nothing, darling. Nothing? On the front page of the Sentinel? <sighs> Ned, mm. what's this all about? Oh, now, why don't we have some tea first? This lawsuit isn't new to you. No. No, of course not. I've, uh... I've known about it for some time. Of course you have, and you've been having sleepless nights and headaches for some time. What does this man accuse you of? Oh, pretty nearly everything he could dream up. Why? Why would a man do that? Oh, because he figures he can make some money. But surely he must have some reason. There must be something he thinks you've done. All right. All right, darling, I'll tell you the whole story. Mary, dear, you must know that whenever... A fortune is made overnight. There are always some envious people who believe they deserve a share of the windfall. And that's exactly what Elwell thinks. Who is Elwell? I don't know that name. Well, he's, uh, he's a man I put in to the Blue Star. He made some money, and now he wants more. How did you put him into it? Well, he, he uh, brought me the samples to be assayed. And, uh, well, I told you about it at the time, but I uh, didn't make a big deal out of it in case they proved to be worthless. I think I'm... Be but if everything is the way you say, and you paid well, him... Well, of course I paid him. Well, then why does he sue you now? Oh, well, probably because some lawyer got hold of him and talked him into it, hoping for a fat fee. Or, or maybe he thought I'd get scared. Now, Bob Elwell ought to have known me better than that. I certainly agreed with that. Anyone did business with Ned would know he wasn't the sort to be frightened of anything. But there was no question that he was worried. And I was hardly surprised when he turned to me one night and said... Charlie, have you any idea how long it's supposed to be before you know whether or not you've seen the Ling ghost? Why, no. None. Have you? No. No, of course not. It's a rather an odd question to ask me, darling, unless you think you have seen the ghost. Well, I uh, really don't know why I asked the question. It just popped into my head, and so I asked it. I know your engineer's mind, Ned. And I know how it worries and worries about a problem until you've solved it. Now, I want you to tell me something on your solemn word of honor. Promise. Okay, my word of honor. That you believe you have seen the Ling Ghost and that you're trying to keep it from me and that's what's worrying you? Cross my heart, darling. I don't think I've seen the Ling Ghost. At least, not to my knowledge, because according to the ancient tradition, one really doesn't know when he's seen the ghost. And with that, I had to be satisfied. I knew my husband. There was no more to be gained from questioning him. But I thought to myself, maybe there was something to be gained from questioning the ghost. That is, if I could manage to locate the elusive spirit. Of course, I knew that you weren't supposed to be able to know you'd seen the ghost. But I was haunted by the idea of the disappearing figure we'd seen from the rooftop. 
So once again I climbed the small secret stairway and stood on the roof ledge. I cupped my hands and shouted to the sky, Oh, spirit, specter, shadow, whatever you choose to call yourself, we've done you no harm. We want to live here in peace. Oh, ghost of Ling, break with the past, break with tradition and show yourself to me. Mary, Mary, what on earth do you think you're doing? <laughs> That's obvious, isn't it, darling? Well, if you mean you're making a darn fool of yourself and, incidentally, of me, yes. Well, I'm sorry if I was stupid. It isn't stupidity, Mary. It's just this obsession of yours with a ghost. You're only adding to my worries. I don't want that. You know I don't want that. Well, then maybe, maybe we should leave Ling. Oh, but I love this house, and so do you. Well, but I think there's something else we have to do, and let's get right on with it. Ned was just trying to help me, like the staff here at Innerwood. And he thought, maybe by arranging a seance with a reputable and respected medium, might put my mind at rest. Ned thought that perhaps the medium might be able to get through and reach the ghost. Uh, no, you both understand that as a man of integrity, I can promise you nothing. Yes, Mr. Woods, you've already made that very clear. It is difficult to overemphasize the possibility of failure. Can we start, please? Please be patient, Mrs. Boyne. All the research I have done on the ghost of Ning seems to bear out the tradition. He or she appears and only afterwards do the people realize they have made contact with the ghost. Yes, we know all that. But isn't it also true that there's never been an attempt to reach this ghost through a reputable medium? Ah, that, that is so. Well, that's why we came to you. I want to find out if there is a ghost of Ling, and if there is, you should be able to reach him. I should, but uh, as I said... Please, let's not go through all that again. Let's hope you will succeed. Right. Now, this is our first seance. Ah, well, I'm afraid it is very much like what you have read in books and heard about. We will keep this room dimly candled it, just as it is now, and so... I ask you to join hands with me. Huh? That is it. Now, close your eyes and concentrate. On what? On the ghost. But I want... Just think of the ghost, Mrs. Boyne. If there is any communication, it must come through me. Is it over now? It is over. Yes. Well, you said you might fail. I did not fail. But we didn't see or hear a thing. Did you, Ned? Uh oh, nothing. I pierced the veil. I reached my control. Well, then what? You said you thought I was an expert. And I believe I convinced you that I am not a fake. Well, okay. But if you reach. Let me assure you. That there is no spirit, no ghost, happy or unhappy, inhabiting these premises at Lean. Ned, mm -hmm. tell me, did you believe Mr. Woods? Well, darling, he's supposed to be the best, and he said there definitely wasn't any ghost at Lean. Hey. Mm -hmm. Something's happened to you. What? It's happened since the sale. I don't know what you're talking about. You're different. Oh, come on, Mary. Maybe something did happen at that sale. What? I mean, those drawn lines in your face have disappeared. Smiles come back into your eyes. <laughs> you slept better last night. Come on, admit it. All right, all right, I admit that. But it has nothing to do with the seance. Well, then what caused the change? Well, perhaps it was a cable I received yesterday oh. saying that I could probably expect some very good news about that Elwell suit very shortly. Then it was the lawsuit that bothered you after all. Yeah, well, yes, perhaps more than I knew. Well, at any rate, we'll find out with tomorrow's mail. Has the mail come yet? No, no, not yet, darling. Anyway, I thought you were you were going to be all taken up with that engineer from Dorsetshire who's going to show us how to install a hot water system. 
Well, I'm looking forward to his visit, but I, I remember what you said about the mail. Oh, oh, oh there's the postman now, dear. Yeah, let me beat you to it, Mary. <laughs> we'll go together. All right. Ah, here we are. Oh, air mail special from Waukesha. What does it say? Open it, All open right. it. All right. Ah, good news, darling. You mean you've won? You've won the lawsuit? Oh, the suit's been withdrawn, so there's nothing to worry about. Then everything's all right. Oh, couldn't be righter. No, how about giving me a kiss, and you go wait for that engineer. One of the strangest things I remember was my total sense of security as Ned held me in his arms. I left Ned and walked out into the gardens. Oh, the day was beautiful. It seemed even brighter than it actually was because of the change in Ned. As I walked along the flagstones, I, I heard footsteps behind me. I stopped and turned. I came to see Mr. Boyne. I'm Mrs. Boyne. Do you have an appointment with my husband? I think he expects me. Well, he's working on a book. So he never sees anyone in the morning. Oh. Wait. You seem tired. Have you come a long way? Yes, I have come a long way. Well, then I suppose if you'll go to the house, my husband will see you. You'll find him in the library. It's that way. I watched the stranger enter the house, and then I went to find the gardener, and soon the engineer arrived, and the morning just sped by. We'd finished with the plans for the hot water system, and it was time for lunch. I went to the dining room, but Ned wasn't at the table. Nor was he in the library. I remember calling and calling and then asking the servants whether they'd seen him. But Ned was nowhere to be found. Not at the luncheon, not in the garden, not in the house. He didn't come back that afternoon, nor was he there for dinner. By that time, I was frantic and called the police. The local police shook their heads and called in Scotland Yard. Well, now, Mrs. Bourne, I can only try to reassure you by telling you that we haven't found your husband's body. Well, that's very reassuring, Inspector. You, you're telling me my husband has just disappeared into thin air, vanished without a trace? Oh, no, ma'am. What I'm trying to say is that if there was any foul play, and in these cases sometimes there is, we usually find the body of the dead man within 48 oh. hours. So perhaps I was clumsy, but I was trying to tell you that there is hope that Mr. Boyne is alive. Well, then where is he? Oh, of course, I can't answer that question for you at this time. But I promise you, Mrs. Boyne, all the resources of Scotland Yard will be employed to find him for you. Oh. I must admit, the inspector kept his word and also kept my hopes alive. The Yard kept me up to date on every development. But alas, they were so pitifully few. They did nothing to nourish my hope that my darling Ned would soon come back to me. All the resources of Scotland Yard, will they prove to be as ineffective as all the king's men and all the king's horses in putting Humpty Dumpty together again? Will they come up with some strange and sinister solution to the disappearance of Ned Boyne? I'll be back with the answers shortly. The disappearance of husbands is usually regarded by most police as a mystery with fairly obvious solutions. Most commonly, the police look for the runaway mate who's been unable to cope with a nagging wife. Or, secondarily, a woman who has decided to strike out looking for a new mate by disposing of the old one. Of course, neither of these theories was even entertained for a moment by Scotland Yard in the case of the disappearance of Ned Boyne. Ah, uh, Mrs. Boyne, we all know what a good marriage you and Mr. Boyne had. But we're momentarily at a loss. A man just doesn't vanish off the face of the earth. Not without leaving clues. Something that will help us find him. Now, if you don't mind, we'll just go back once more over the way you found out he, he was gone. 
I spent most of the morning with a Mr. Loomis, an engineer from Dorsetshire, going over some plans he had for installing a hot water system. If you don't mind, I'd like to get to the stranger who asked for your husband. Well, I've told you everything I know about him. And told it well, ma'am. A good description. Much better than we got from Nellie, the housemaid. She saw him too? Oh, yes, indeed. We even found out that he wrote his name on a card he gave her. Well, then you should know. If I may, ma'am, let me just condense the maid's testimony from my notes here. Now, she said that the gentleman was a stranger and perhaps a foreigner. He asked for Mr. Boyne, and she asked who was calling, and then he wrote his name on a piece of paper... And asked her to carry it into your husband. Well, didn't you ask her what Ned, uh, my husband, said when she brought him the paper? Well, Nellie told us your husband didn't have time to say anything. Because just as she handed the paper to Mr. Boyne, she realized that the stranger had followed her into the library. She left them together. If Nellie says that she left this stranger alone in the library with my husband... How can we be so sure that Ned left the house? Ah, it isn't the maid's evidence we're going by, ma'am. Hilton, the gardener, swears he saw your husband leave the house by the front door, accompanied by a gentleman. And he gives a description which pretty much tallies with yours and Nellie's. But why? Why would Ned just go off like that without a word to me or to anyone? You've already said your husband has been worried... So if you could give us some clue as to what it was that was bothering him... Well, I've told you about that lawsuit back in America. But you didn't tell us about the seance and your attempts to locate the Ling ghost. Now, surely, Inspector, you're not going to tell me that Scotland Yard is taking ghost stories seriously. Oh, no, ma'am. But if Mr. Boyne did, it might be some explanation of his erratic behavior. Are you telling me that you think my husband was mentally ill? Well, now, Mum, we need something to explain a happily married wealthy man walking off in the middle of the morning accompanied by a stranger and so far leaving no trace. But what about that unfinished letter you found in the library? It obviously had to do with that business in America, which you, Mum, assured us wasn't bothering your husband one bit. But he did write the word safer, didn't he? Who was Parvis? Ah, now, we've checked, and Mr. Parvis is a perfectly respectable attorney back in Waukesha. And your husband's unfinished letter simply reads, My dear Parvis, I have just received your letter announcing Elwell's death, and while I suppose there is now no farther risk of trouble, it might be safer... There, he says trouble, doesn't he? Oh, he does indeed. And you believe that trouble could be so serious as to make him disappear without a word to you about it? Or the reason for leaving? Oh, no, we just can't believe that, Mrs. Boyne. Then what do you believe? I mean, what has happened? Mrs. Boyne, has your husband ever suffered from amnesia? Never. Does he have any medical history you could tell us about? Ned was always healthy. Well, England is a hard place to get lost in, Mum. It's almost impossible for two men to slip unnoticed through or out of the country. How about just walking? Mrs. Boyne, we have every official means of investigation working, and we've found nothing. And so things remained at a stalemate for the next fortnight. Despite the fact that my husband's name was headlined in every newspaper and his likeness looked down into my anguished eyes from the walls of every town and village was still not one single word of him and no trace of his movements. And then one morning, Nellie brought a card to me in the library with the name Edward Parvis on it and a new hope flooded my heart. Mrs. Boyne? Mr. Parvis, from Waukesha. You're the attorney my husband wrote to. Yes, I found myself here in England and I thought I should visit you. Oh, I'm so glad you did. You heard, of course, of my husband's disappearance and I'm hoping that you've come to shed some light on it. Well, I'm afraid you're in for a disappointment. My errand is of quite a different nature. But his last unfinished letter was to you. I mean, surely... Uh, Mrs. Boyne... Is it possible you're unaware of what went on back at Waukesha? Oh, my husband and I were very close. We had no secrets from each other. Well, I'm wondering what you mean to do about Bob Elwell's family. Bob Elwell's family? I'm completely confused. I I don't know them. 
Uh, Mr. Parvis, you must bear with me. I do need your help. And I'm almost beginning to believe you. Well, First of all, Bob Elwell is dead. His wife's oh. a proud woman, and oh, she fought on as long as she could. It's come out now how badly off the family is, and we're taking up a fund for her. Elwell. Wait. That was the man Ned told me had helped him with the Blue Star. That's what he told you, is it? Well, it's true, isn't it? Well, it's true, and yet it's... Well, all I can say is that it was business. I don't understand at all. Bob Elwell just wasn't smart enough, let's put it that way. It's the kind of thing that happens every day in business. Mr. Parvis, I think you're trying to tell me nicely that my husband did something dishonorable. Well, I, I don't want you getting the wrong idea about Ned. He committed no crime. What? exactly did he do? He, well, he went into business with Bob Elwell, and uh, Bob should have been more careful about what he signed. Why don't you come right out and say that Bob Elwell should never have trusted Ned? Well, it was Elwell's claim that he came to Ned with the first samples from the Blue Star. Uh, you see, the Blue Star had been started and then abandoned. And uh, Elwell believed there was a chance the previous owners had quit too soon. But he came to my husband with this sample. That's right. And your husband assayed. They both wanted to keep the whole thing quiet, because if there was any chance the Blue Star was still worth something, well, I don't have to tell you what that would have meant. And Ned decided that the Blue Star was still a gold mine. Right. Your husband and Elwell had to buy the Blue Star. They bought it together? They did. Elwell borrowed most of the money he put up to purchase the mine. Well, so far that all seems pretty straightforward. Uh-huh. Ned had the papers drawn up, and Elwell, well, he should have read them more carefully. Why? What did the papers say? That after Elwell had been paid back for the money he'd invested and received a profit of 5%, the entire ownership of the Blue Star reverted to Ned. Oh, no. Well, it was business, Mrs. Boyne. Elwell didn't have to sign it. Well, evidently, his lawyers felt that there was some merit to his claim when he sued Ned recently. Well, they soon found out they didn't have a leg to stand on. But if Elwell was so badly off, where did he find the money to hire lawyers? A lot of people thought Elwell had been treated badly, and his lawyer was one of them. You mean they took the case for nothing? On a contingency basis. But when they saw they didn't have a case, they advised Elwell to withdraw the suit. Elwell became despondent and shot himself. Shot himself? He killed himself because of that? Well, he didn't kill himself exactly. He dragged on two months before he died. And he tried to kill himself and failed? And then tried again? No. He didn't have to try again. Well, the newspapers got hold of it, and it's all been raked up again, and this collection thing's been started. You know, most of us back in Waukesha like Bob Elwell. Here, here's an account of the whole thing from the Sentinel. Uh, maybe it would help you if you looked it over. From the headline, it would seem the Sentinel knows who's to blame. Widow of Ned Boyne's victim, forced to appeal for aid. Well, I thought maybe you might care to... This picture! This, this picture! It says this is Robert Elwell. Yes, it is. But this is the man, the man who came for my husband. I mean, I'd know him anywhere. Mrs. Boyne, I, I don't think you're very well. Shall I call somebody? No, no, this is Robert Elwell. This is the man who spoke to me in the garden. That can't be the man. It's Robert Elwell. It was Robert Elwell who came for him. Came for Ned? Elwell was dead. You know that now, don't you? Robert Elwell came for him. Now, Mrs. Boyne, well, surely you remember your husband's unfinished letter to me. It was written after he'd heard of Elwell's death. Robert Elwell was the man who spoke to me. That's impossible. I think I'm mad. I'm not. I'm quite sane. Will you answer me one question? Please, when did Robert Elwell try to kill himself? When? Yes, the date. Please try to remember. 
I don't think we should continue this conversation, Mrs. Bo- I have a reason for asking. I'm sure you have, but... Well, I really can't remember. I, I guess about two months before he actually died. I need the exact date. We might find it in the paper here. Uh, yes, here it is. Last October. The 20th, wasn't it? Yeah, the 20th. Then you did know about Elwell all the time. I know now. Sunday, the 20th. That was the day he came here first. Came here first? Yes. You... You saw him twice then? Yes, twice. First on the 20th of October. I remember because that was the day I first discovered the secret staircase. And we saw him from the roof. He was dressed just as he is in the picture in the newspaper. My husband saw him first. He was frightened and ran down ahead of me. But there was no one there. He had vanished. You say Elwell vanished? Yes. I see now what happened. He tried to come then, but he wasn't really dead. He couldn't reach us. He had to wait two months to die. And then he came back again. And Ned went with him. (gasps) Oh, good Lord. I sent him to Ned. I told him where to go. I sent him to this room. That's what they say about the Ling Ghost. One never really knows that he's seen the ghost till afterward. Long, long afterward. All the doctors at the rest home where they're treating Mrs. Mary Boyne are convinced that she's suffering from an almost historic sense of loss and bereavement because of the inexplicable disappearance of her husband. They're also all convinced that if only they could furnish her with a satisfactory explanation of that disappearance, she would be cured. But of course, we know better. At least, we who believe know that it's the explanation rather than the disappearance that's the root of her trouble. I'll be back in a moment. And now, the shortest ghost story in the world. The long, dark, memory-filled corridors of one of the great art museums of the world just before closing time. A man hastens to the exit. He's joined by another art lover. The first man says, Hey, it's pretty spooky around here at this hour. Yes, says the second man. Do you believe in ghosts? No, says the first man. Do you? Yes, replies the second, and vanishes. Our cast included Celeste Holm, Larry Haynes, Joan Shea, Guy Sorrell, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. (laughs) 